Welcome to the Celtics Reddit Podcast. Ben Vallis here. Thank you for joining us. Hope you're doing well. The Celtics wrap up a tremendous week going 3-0 since our last podcast, defeating, admittedly, three of the worst teams in the league, including the Lakers. Joining us to talk all about it, Celtics Jay. Jay, how you doing, sir? I'm doing well. How are you doing, Ben? I am doing very well off the back of the things that I just mentioned. That the Celtics Hard are not winning to be hype and, right uh, now. It's very uh, troubling to admit how much that affects my like, day-to-day outlook on, on the world, but uh, right now, things are looking good. Things are going so well for the Celtics right now that I'm becoming a Dennis Schroeder fan. Well, we've definitely got to unpack that, because that is a huge <laughs> 180. Uh, and of course, joining us, the king of OC, Mr. Wayne Spoonie. Spoons, how you doing, sir? Ooh-hoo! Doing great. 8-3 <laughs> in our last 11. Jay's loving Dennis Schroeder. How could things be any better? I mean, honestly, three and zero since my cat made an appearance. I mean, we're just, that's true. The vibes are immaculate right now. Bring that cat back around, mate. We need more of that. <laughs> She'll be around, I'm sure. <laughs> well, look, plenty to get to here. Uh, but the news of the past 24 hours is that both Jalen Brown and Robert Williams returned from injury. Spoons, we'll start with you. How do you think Jalen and Rub looked in their return? I think it was a tale of two different players. I didn't really notice anything different for Rob. Uh, Somebody wrote in the post-game thread. I I didn't grab their username, but they said that I feel like Rob could have grabbed every single rebound if he wanted to. And I feel the same way. He only scored two points. He was one for one from the field. But I felt like he dominated that game just physically. Jalen, on the other hand, looked really rusty. Uh, and he still had 19 on 6 of 13 shooting. So a rusty Jalen Brown is still an That'll incredibly good basketball player. Yeah. So, uh, <laughs> so I'm a little nervous that he's questionable for our next game. I'm nervous about his knee, but uh, he looked rusty, but still he looked pretty solid. Yeah, I'll take a rusty J uh, any day. Uh, and we'll throw it now <laughs> yep. to a non-rusty J in Celtics J. J, what are your <laughs> thoughts on this one? I don't know, man. I felt a couple. I felt a little rusty last couple of shows. No joke, especially after the last several weeks, because there's just been plenty of transition on on this end for me. But these last couple of games and have been absolutely still effective. lovely. Still, still effective. You know, you got listen. You still got to perform. The show must go on. Um, exactly. And it, it really has. Like I, 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 I'm gonna echo the sentiments that that Spoons is throwing down. You know, it, Rob is showing a commitment to the boards right now that I know as a fan base. I think we have just been so eager to see for a while like to the extent that we get excited over guys like Tristan Thompson and Ines Cantor because rebounding has been such a foreign concept for most of for most of our years as uh, as Celtic fans here so seeing Rob out there being able to legitimately dominate when he just sets his mind to being a board getter Um, and then he's affecting both the way the ball is you know moving to the paint or not to the paint on defense with his impact there and his awareness but he's also helping move the ball on offense so it's just it's lovely to see that lineup come together because we haven't seen too many minutes there um, with all five of those guys on the floor together nice to see and I I agree Jalen looked maybe not quite as Jalen as he was in the first handful of games that he played so far this season but for a guy coming back after a couple weeks out he looked about as good as I could ask him to look. Um, that jump shot started looking real nice, uh, you know, in that second half as well. And when you got both the Jays cooking, it it just gets so much easier for the other guys. And if they're moving, and I think we're gonna we're gonna get into it a little bit when they're moving, it opens the door up for so much success that this team could have. Um, because they've got a good squad with a lot of talent. They're not the most elite shooting roster in the league, but they've got other other things that can compensate for it as long as they're tapped in and they're, you know, they're locked into the concept. Yeah. And I'll say, I think the, the biggest thing that where I noticed Jalen wasn't quite right is he had that crazy lefty scoop layup in transition, which was an amazing play, but he would have just put normally when he's feeling really healthy, he would have put the defender behind the basket with just his force and dunked all over him. 
Yeah. But he slowed it up and took a weird little Euro step and finished with that incredible lefty finish. But it I just still knew looked pretty. Like, it still looked amazing, still but it's like pretty. not it's not Jalen Brown. You know what I mean? No, it's not a hundred percent Jalen Brown. It. Still yeah, has some juice to man. it. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, and here's and the thing. We're the... saying Jalen looked rusty, right? But six for thirteen, uh in you know, field goals in general, three for six from three, four for four from the free throw line, like Again, I'll take a rusty Jalen Brown if that's what that looks yep. like. I mean, that's that's well, pretty good. Nine line. points, nine yeah. points in whatever it was, thirteen seconds. It was T Mac esque in the amount of points he racked up in a small amount of time. And in that third quarter, there, where for the most part in the first half, the Celtics looked pretty lackluster and playing down yep. to their opponent. That third quarter, our mate Joe always says games are won and lost in the third quarter. And Jalen was an integral part of that run, kind of like Solo ran it himself, really. Um, yeah. despite the rustiness, despite, you know, the tightness in his hamstring that he mentioned he felt during the game, he was able to put up a shitload of points in very little time. So, uh, I'll take a rusty J any day <laughs> over, uh, over Aaron Neesmith, who maybe we'll get to a little bit later. Um, whoa, whoa. Uh, <laughs> shots fired. <laughs> Uncalled for. Um, the, the quality of the defense has remained consistent for the most part. It's sort of become the team's identity and you know, we've seen enough of it that way. We're kind of like used to it. Um, but what trends are you guys noticing on the offensive side? Yeah, ball so movement. I'll say, yeah, <laughs> ball movement for Talk sure. I have some, I have some indicators of healthy offense that I always look to. You want to be driving to the paint and you want to be generating catch and shoot looks because that means you're breaking down the defense. You're getting easy shots for people. And we're missing a lot of open shots, but it hasn't really mattered so far. So this year, we're seventh in catch-and-shoot point per, points per game. Last year, we were 26th, so like Oklahoma City level bad. This year, we're <laughs> sixth in drives per game. Last year, we were 17th, right? And that's just indicative of step-back, ugly offense we saw all year last year. But this year... Schroeder's helped a lot. He's getting to the rim. He's kicking out. Smart is getting to the rim. He's kicking out. Tatum, I think, has really made it a point to get himself to the rim. And those those are kind of the indicators where it's like, if you're getting to the rim, you're putting paint pressure, you're getting open catch and shoots, that's good. Even if you don't shoot catch and shoots that well, which we absolutely do not, it's still good <laughs> offense. Unless your name is so, Romeo Langford, in which case you yeah. shoot them incredibly well. Then you never miss. <laughs> uh, what do you think, Jay? For me, I mean, I, I, was, I was pretty vocal about my frustrations with Dennis Schroeder, especially a handful of games ago, because of just the, the pavement pounding happening with the ball, just the over-dribbling. We've seen it from the Jays on occasion, and by occasion, I mean most of the time for the last couple of years. Um, and then, so to see it with, Jalen out and and to see Dennis kind of stepping into a more integral role especially with the starting lineup in the offense I kept getting frustrated because I felt like smart running that point and being the instigator of the offense just tended to to lean us more towards ball movement as as opposed to dribble penetration as the primary means of, of making making things happen on offense and it seems like they've been able to start finding a balance I mean at one at one point I know we were all like screaming for you know never to see we were talking about the double bigs last season and how frustrating that was, but the, the double smalls with, with Dennis Schroeder and Marcus Smart in that starting lineup together, there's times when that can be really, really frustrating, especially when Schroeder's taking more of that primary ball handler role. But I think we've seen more balance over the last handful of games, and I think especially last night with Dennis coming off the bench, um, we saw how that lineup can be really effective because when Schroeder just has to come in and ball out against a second unit, forget it. I mean, it's a... It's, it, it's very easy to understand how he's so capable of winning that six man of the year with, you know, in his sleep, almost nope. the way that he can attack, get buckets. I mean, that mid range game when he's got it cooking is just, it's stupid levels of just effective. Like that guy, he's a savant the way that he gets the ball in there sometimes. Um, so Gorman I'm willing to loves take it too. You know, like, I mean, it, it <laughs> just is. loves it. And when he's making <laughs> quick decisions, right. And this, I do think that when we see him, scoring you know efficient and effectively we do see him just moving and operating in a different way 
when he goes deep into a shop clock with that dribble, we don't see a lot of movement and we don't see a lot of good momentum built. But when he's quickly moving the ball, cutting and making quick decisions when it comes back to him, because people are more than happy to give the ball back to him, which is like, that's what I love seeing. He, he kicks it out, comes back, he makes the quick cut, and then he's either getting a bucket or he's making a kick out. Um, good things are happening. The ball is moving. It's going inside out. It's swinging around. We're seeing all sorts of great, great action right now, and especially off ball stuff in this last game. I just... I, I almost fell over in my chair seeing some of the off-ball movement in this last game. Even Tatum was moving off-ball. I almost had a stroke. <laughs> yeah, it's just fucking pleasing, for lack of a better term. It's I feel sad. like we've watched oh, so many other teams. Like we've Thinking back to last year, we played so many teams that the heat come to mind where you watch the way they move off-ball and you're just like, why can't we have that? Why aren't we doing that? And to see us do that on a regular basis, and I mentioned that we've played some pretty bad teams in the last few games. Um, but, you know, Yudoka mentioned now that the, the defense, uh, you know, mountain has been summited, that they're going to now turn their focuses to the offensive end. And like straight away, we're seeing it. It's great. Yeah. And uh, it's just so nice to finally like own some of that rather than, you know, look uh, longingly and jealously at, uh, at other teams for, uh, you know, executing the, the same style of offense. It's just so just pleasant. not to hijack <laughs> us a little bit here, but because of a, a previous conversation Spoons and I had at, on, a, on a pod over the offseason talking about Ime Udoka and the impact that he may have. I remember there being a lot of concerns because a lot of the quotes that we had coming out were matching quotes that were similar to what we've seen with coaches that were not very successful, right? Um, you know, for as much as he's got all these opportunities and, and things supporting his, you know, hopeful success, there's equal opportunities for things to not go very well. And at different times early on in this season, we've already seen that. I mean, at one point, the majority of at least the online fan base was calling for the guy to get fired after like five or six games. Um, <laughs> yep. but spoons given some of the anxieties you had early on like how are you feeling most especially with what ben just noted which is that like we've seen now at a couple of critical points the team needed to make some kind of move and pivot to change the course of the, or the way things were going and we've seen this team kind of respond twice now pretty effectively to those moments and in focused ways are we are we definitely attributing that as part of the EMA factor spoons what are you thinking yeah, so I my huge concern uh, when I think Ben and I did a two-man pod earlier was the defense was a complete mess, and that's ironed itself out, like, and then some more than I could have hoped. And offensively, my big concern was we're not running, like, any pick-and-roll for Tatum. He's been running a lot more pick-and-roll recently, yeah. and he's dominating now. Uh, and I think that's partly to do with it but I think to your point Jay the other part of it is the ball's popping around we're getting into the paint and guys are touching it I don't know if you listen to the most recent Zach Lowe podcast with uh, Howard Beck but they were talking about why the Warriors are so effective is that they leverage Steph Curry's off ball um, his his off ball gravity to get other guys touches so the role players touch the ball the role players feel empowered and the role players play above their head because they're seeing the ball a lot and that is something that did not happen last year and you can see it this year like Grant Williams is touching the ball in the paint and like kicking it out Rob's getting the ball Horford's getting the ball Schroeder's getting the ball it's not just Tatum running a pick and roll and then trying to break down a mismatch, right? Like the ball's pinging around. It's like These Oprah guys are out there. Yeah, you get a Josh possession Richardson. and you get a possession. Yeah. Everybody exactly. gets a possession. <laughs> exactly. And these guys, I mean, people respond to that, man. Nobody wants to play basketball for 30 minutes and touch the ball every third possession. That sucks. And, you know, Richardson's playing well. Like I think how we're playing offense is a big part of why he's playing well. Like he's, mm -hmm. it's not Dallas anymore. He's not standing in the corner and watching Luca operate. He's getting a piece of the ball. So I I'm totally with you. I mean, I think this is definitely a big part of what Yudok is preaching. And I think another big part of that is the guys are listening to him. They had probably tuned Brad out. He's probably a better coach in a vacuum than Yudoka, but that doesn't matter if people aren't listening to him anymore. And they're listening to Yudoka and Things are on the up, up up and up on both sides of the ball. I mean, I think that's unequivocal. Like, you can't really argue otherwise. All the drama that seemed to almost erupt from the quote-unquote, uh, you know, team meeting 
that got kind of blown out of proportion because it was like actually just some dinner that was already pre-scheduled that they got to have a little bit of a conversation with. But <laughs> the media tried to take that and turn it into a complete shit show. And, you know, the team just kind of like rolled with it. They didn't overreact. And, like no one seemed to overreact. Even like some of the quotes that came out and people were trying to frame it as like argumentative and team dissent and everything's imploding. They just kind of kept moving forward and not reading too much into it. Yeah and just doing what they needed to do. And I think that is demonstrative of the impact that Ime and this coaching staff is having, because like you're kind of noting as well, spoons, you know, they, they seem to be on the same page, at least conceptually. Right. And, and in, in spirit. Yeah. And as far as what they're trying to do, whether it works on any given night or at any given point in a game, they're at least, always seeming to come back to that and, and have that common ground. And, and it doesn't really seem like anyone's getting maliciously thrown under the bus. I know folks were feeling away because Marcus called out, you know, Jay, uh, you know, Jalen and, and Jason, but who else on the team can do it, right? Who else on the team has a, the stones, <laughs> you know, and, and B any kind of clout whatsoever to actually call them into check. Like, obviously he's not the caliber of player that either of them are, but like they respect him. Like you gotta respect Smart as a player on the court. So I don't know. I think if there's anyone on the roster that was gonna say yeah. anything, like that's the guy that would and should. That was the turning point for sure. Um it was disappointing at the time the way Marcus Smart called out, you know, other players on the team, especially given his performance or lack thereof at the time of making those comments. Yeah, but he was a he's mess. He's led too, the way sure. and you know, the you know, mentioned the turning point. Well, yeah, but since then, he, he's really turned his play style around, and it feels like the, the team yeah. has sort of fallen in line behind that. Uh, uh, but, Spoonie, I wanted to get to the, the paint touches that you were talking about a moment ago because it's, it's huge as far as, um, you know, the, that offensive, I guess the Oprah philosophy, if we want to call it that. Um, <laughs> Celtics are ninth in paint touches in the last five games, and that's up from a 20th overall rank through the season so far. So from 20th to ninth in a small amount of time, obviously a small sample size, huge as far as that offensive turnaround um some i guess some negative aspects or uh if we want to take a positive spin some areas for improvement would be that the celtics is they're still only 17th in assists per game over that past five games despite the success we've seen uh in that small sample size and also strangely this is i was looking the amount of time that we sort of posted up um, Marcus Smart, particularly on Fred Van Vliet in that Raptors game, and sort of the eye test told me that we'd had success in post-ups, but looking at the stats, no. <laughs> Celta third in post-ups per game, but ranked 27th in field goal percentage off of those post-up post -up attempts, um, which is a shocking differential based on my, my I guess, my, um, you know, observational takeaways from these games. Yeah, and it's the same as like the ISO differential. We ISO a ton, although I think we've been doing it less and we're terrible at ISOs. Uh, I just, the, the post up is not an efficient way to play modern offense. The way it is efficient is if you're passing out of post ups by drawing mm -hmm. attention. So I don't like that we're third. I think that's way too much. Tatum's not a particularly good post up player. Like he'll hit his, you know, if he's got a smaller guy on him. He'll hit that turnaround mid-range jumper over him, but you don't want to do that 15 times a game. Like you're you're gonna lose. Period. Hold on, uh, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna so stop you there. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you if he shoots that one that he was shooting <laughs> against the Rockets, which is like that same little turnaround, like almost Dirk like fadeaway that we saw yeah, against a bunch the in his rookie season. <laughs> yeah, it's against the Rockets. I get it. Listen, but we did what you're supposed to do against a team like the Rockets, right? But like he hasn't well, even gone to that turnaround in a while. Like that's the first time I saw him go back to that in a minute. He shot it over Avery Bradley as well uh, against the Lakers, and you know, say what you will about the Rockets team or individual defense, but Avery Bradley still has some defensive chops. Obviously, uh, spoon is shaking his head. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, <laughs> <Okay>. man. <laughs> hey, Tatum's the type of guy that always roasted Bradley. <laughs> like Bradley can handle Schroeder, he cannot handle a six foot eight forward that's just the type of dude that always crushed him but no I mean there's a place in the offense for it totally agree third and post-ups we don't have Joel Embiid we don't have Jokic what that's are we fair. doing third and post-ups that's too yeah. much that's lazy offense uh but I think things are changing I feel like he's posting up less running more pick and roll 
and we're cruising, man. Like, our defense is so good, it probably doesn't matter much how good our offense is, frankly. Yeah, things are changing. Uh, things are turning around. Use a red cigar on Celtics Red. It made a post saying the Celtics are first in defensive rating and third in overall net rating in the past 11 games. And that's not a sample size to shake a stick at. 11 games is pretty solid. We've had some injuries during that time to, to yeah. hold those rankings and both those uh, categories uh, over an 11 game stretch is uh, fucking awesome. Let's be honest. It's great. <laughs> the vibes are immaculate. Um, we should get to some sort of individual player analysis though. And, you know, we've touched on Tatum already, but you know, he's, he's clearly out of his slump. And if you look at his stats from the past five games, 31 and a half points per game, eight and a half rebounds, four assists, a steal, a block, and shooting at a 47.3% uh, clip from the field. And that's up from 41% from his season average so far. Uh, you know, we talked about the way that he's looking for his shots, you know, more pick and roll play, uh, choosing to run that ISO play when he has an offensive advantage over his defender. Celtics J, what else are you noticing from, uh, from Jason Tatum that's part of this, this turnaround? Well, I, I've liked that, you know, it's not as if he's just going ballistic and, and hitting everything from three. Like, that outside shot is still, like, I think the last game he was, what, one for nine from three? Um, so, yeah. like, shooting from distance, it's still not quite maybe exactly what we'd expect. Um, I mean, it's weird to look at the numbers right now for this team because of the way we started off the season. So I think, like, some of the generalized, like, you know, to this date stats um, look a little funny because, like, right now, Josh Richardson is a better, you know, statistically looking at the numbers, he's a better three-point shooter right now than, than Tatum, than Horford, than Pritchard, than Neesmith. Um, it's kind of a weird dynamic when you look at, uh, you know, where folks are at numbers-wise right now. But you have to expect that he's climbing up because he's everything he's doing right now looks more deliberate, looks more decisive, looks more just organic and natural in-the-moment decision-making, reactivity. Whereas we were talking earlier how everything seemed to be like he was kind of out of, sync, out of sync with where his like thoughts for what he wants to do and what he's actually doing um, just seemed like there was some kind of delay. Um, maybe he was buffering. I don't know how it works, but um, it's nice to see him being <laughs> much quicker on the decision making, uh, seeing him moving off the ball. I just I see him attacking defenses right now, whereas it seemed like he was trying to like outmaneuver defenses before. And so they're having to actually react to where he is and, and what he's doing. Uh, we'll, I think we're going to look at a play a little bit later um, that'll kind of demonstrate exactly that, where there's, there's so much attention being paid to him that it makes it easier then for some of the other role players to make themselves available and open for good looks. And so when he's being quick and decisive like that, it, it opens the floor up in ways that, are, that go beyond just assist numbers, which I think is a large part of what we're seeing with his offensive effectiveness over the last several games. Yeah, and I, you know why I think part of he's looked so much better making decisions is because they're a lot easier to make decisions when Grant Williams is on the floor instead <laughs> of the double big. He's our best three point shooter it's spaced right now. Out and you're, uh, yeah, by like a long shot. <laughs> when it's spaced out, <laughs> yeah, it's, like, it's out, him and Romeo right now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I like, I love Rob Williams. He's an incredible player. I will, I'm about to go to bat for Rob later in the show, but he has nowhere to be when Horford's on the floor, right? right? If Horford's running pick and roll with Tatum, Horford just rolls into Rob when he's in the dunker spot, and then all of a sudden there's two defenders there. So you can't get to the rim. You can't get into the paint and make a play, right? Even if you're running pick and roll. So He's looked well, great. Dennis Schroeder I think says part of that is we're accepted. running more pick and roll. I think part of that, <laughs> I, yeah, yeah, Dennis is. I mean, some of these little goofy shots he hits are incredible. Uh, but I think that part of it's just the floor is spaced better for him, and that makes life a lot easier for for any primary ball handler. Yeah, that's interesting. I, I want to get back to Tatum in a second because we've got a user comment about him. But yeah, the um. Cleaning the glass, like lineups tool, clearly shows that um, we've got a, a much better net rating when only one of those two bigs are on the floor, and that doesn't include Grant Williams. So, like Grant Williams and Al Horford on the floor, or Grant Williams and Robert Williams on the floor, is much better than Robert Williams and Al Horford on the floor together. Um, Al Horford was so adamant 
at the beginning of the season, they're like, yeah, I'm a starter. I expect to start. You know, I'm a starting caliber player. Despite that, do you think, like, based on those numbers, that we can expect that to change at all? Or do you think it's, we're just ride and die with the double big as, as long as they're both here? I think we're going to ride and die with the double big. I think, I mean, they, they're they not playing much together anymore. I think they played, mm-hmm. like, 10 minutes yeah. together last game, which is fine. It sounds like they're going to open with that. Ime likes it to open up. Um, I think it helps set that defense really firm early on. Uh, but, right, we're we're typically seeing them kind of one on, one off most of the game. So I think regardless of how it starts or what that starting lineup looks like, I think we're ultimately still seeing it balanced and, you know, played out in the way where one's typically on the floor while the other one's resting. And the defense is insane with Alan Robb on the floor. Like, yeah. <laughs> has to be by far, out. like the best defense in history by far. So, <laughs> that's awesome. I mean, there's value to having them both on the floor, but I just think if we're looking at Tatum's performance through that lens, having Grant out there as the four, nominal four, is going to be really helpful for him. Yeah. And it's not unusual that in this sort of Tatum analysis segment that we ended up talking about everybody else on the team because. You yeah. know, the, the combination of, of Tatum and who's out there with him is so important. Um, there's a, a comment from a user, Ginger Ninja, who wrote, Tatum was actually cutting to the basket off ball this game. I was so fucking hype. He keeps doing that to get easy twos and learns to rotate on the perimeter to create a kick out lane behind the driving slash posted ball handler for open threes to get hot. And he's going to be casually dropping 40 like once a week and 30 practically every night. And I think he's dropped like 30, what, in the past three or four games, which has been amazing. Four games. Um, yeah, four straight. Off-ball movement. And Tatum like buying in and then everyone falling in line behind. Um, you know, we've got the Nets coming up. And we said this before the Bucks game, before we realized that Giannis and, and Middleton were both going to be out. But like, we're ready. We're ready to see how this looks, you know, a- against a, a competent opponent. No disrespect to the Rockets and the Thunder, at total disrespect to the Lakers. Um, well, I'm excited to see uh, how, that, how that goes. Um, let's move on to Marcus Smart very quickly because uh, I've written here in our run sheet, Marcus Smart, you a point guard? Question mark. Because I just feel like he's really taken on that role the last five games, seven assists and just uh, one turnover and uh, a plus minus of, of plus 10.2 and just 9.8 field goal attempts, which actually like glancing at the stats, felt high to me because I, I've sort of pleasantly uh, okay with the, the lack of, of field goal attempts that he's been putting up. I actually didn't realize it was as high as 10. Um, Spoons, what are your thoughts on, on Marcus Smart overall and he's sort of he's, um, finding a groove in this role? So I think Smart is exactly what I thought and expected from him. I think he's thriving in his role and he's far short of being an all-star, uh, but he's been awesome recently he's uh averaging 9.1 drives per game this year last year he was at seven that was my biggest concern about Marcus as you know the point guard is he's not going to get into the paint enough the offense is going to stagnate then we're going to be looking at step backs and isos again you know for the record Schroeder's at 15.8 drives a game he's 10th in the league no big deal but uh (laughs) smart He's taking care of the basketball. And the big thing is Smart has been a dreadful finisher at the rim his entire career. He's been damn good recently. Like some of the lefty finishes he's had and just some of like the hesitation moves and using his strength has been incredible to watch, man. He's kind of evolving in front of our faces right now. For anyone listening to the audio version of the podcast, Jay has been uh, just like <laughs> smug face a thousand percent <laughs> during Wayne's Eyebrow speedy, raising. So. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Jay uh, has to ask. I can't believe you didn't come you to me first here? on the Marcus Smart bit, man. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit triggered, but I figure you probably did that on purpose. Absolutely. Trolling yeah, you. Let's, let's hear it. <laughs> Listen, uh, regardless of, of Mr. Spoon's uh, wrong take on thinking smart is not an (laughs) inevitable and eventual all-star um you know he listen he came out looking it was rough i mean it was looking rough for everybody and so it it was a little bit bothersome that it seemed like he was getting scapegoated in in a lot of ways for really team failings right like yeah he wasn't playing great but no one was playing great (laughs) like no one's hitting shots um i think as we've seen this team lock it in and start getting some wins together 
it doesn't shock me that we're also seeing, you know, Marcus Smart's game rise up with that. I, I think this team can be so lethal with a really just effective and determined and locked in Marcus Smart. What's really, I think, encouraging to see right now is we are seeing that defensive intensity that Smart kind of made his career early on with re-engaged. I, that's been a criticism the last couple seasons, especially last year. I know a lot of folks have been riding on Marcus for maybe taking a step back defensively, but we're seeing that just reactivated. Um, you know, he's, I think he's still leading the league in steals right now. He's at what? 2.3. Um, I mean, he's, but even beyond just steals, like he, he's just being that old Marcus smart that we've gotten really familiar with, you know, big guy finds him in the post, thinks he's got an advantage. Yeah, guess what? You don't, <laughs> um, got a small guard, uh, on the other end. Yeah. He's gonna, he's gonna try to put him on the post kind of billups him a little bit. But what I've liked from that too, is that he's also, he's looking to pass out of that as much as he's looking to to try to score out of that. And I think that's the fact that smarts game seems entirely focused on, on finding the best shot as opposed to taking the, like the first shot that's available to him. Again, a thing that I feel he's always gotten some unfair criticism for people like he shoots too much. I'm like, do people throw it out to smart at the end of a shot clock? Cause the guy's got the stones to take it. And he doesn't care what the stats say at the end of the day. He's willing to take the shot and keep the defense honest because he believes he can make it, and he should because he has in really big moments. He's paid off big time. Uh, he's gone on huge runs and kept us in games. I think we're seeing more and more of what we can expect from Smart, and I think he's really, I think he's just getting going. I think we're also seeing him getting into like real legit game shape, um, and I think that's why we're seeing him finish better at the rim. I think he's getting better lift. So listen, yeah. by, by all-star break, he might not be an all-star this year, but he's going to open up the eyes and he's, he's setting the table for next season. I, I don't think he came out hot enough to, to end, unless he went on a ballistic run over the next you know month and a half or so, but I don't think that's realistic. So I, I'm, I'm willing to acknowledge that my hopes for Marcus Smart as an all-star this year, probably not happening. Uh -oh. Duh. Probably oh, not I'm happening. Okay. <laughs> I'm right. You're, you're right for now. <laughs> You win. You might win a battle, but Marcus Smart and I, we will win the war. Can Can I just say very quickly, <laughs> the narrative that Smart has slipped on defense needs to end. Oh yeah, yeah. it's like, over now. If I see someone post that in the Reddit again, because it's still happening, mm -hmm. like it? it's over. The How dude you, is like defensive player. Dude, I saw it after last game. Like he's, the, he's playing defensive player of the year level defense right now. Like he is incredible it. on that end. So if and I see he, someone comment that, I'm blocking you. It's over. Yeah, <laughs> simple it's, as that. It's done. He's yeah. uh he's busting out the the Cobra strikes as well, the Marcus Smart signature Cobra yeah, strikes oh, where like so seriously good. like um the the reflexes on that guy to be able to pounce on the ball from so far he's back, you know, watching the game, we have this landscape view of the court. And the amount of ground that he covers to get sort of in front of the retreating defender to get the ball is uh, absolutely insane. And I, I think well and truly a sign that Smart is back. Uh, another underrated aspect of Smart's game, I know we talked about um, how not impactful post-ups are for our team, but Marcus Smart posting up smaller guards. So I mentioned it with Fred Van Vliet against the Raptors recently. Part of the way that we beat the Warriors last year when they visited Boston was Marcus Smart posting up Steph Curry and actually getting him in foul trouble quite early in the game and exploiting that mismatch. Like I think that's a one area of our team where we, we should be posting up more, dare, dare I say it, is, is Smart, but ultimately passing out of those post-ups instead of shooting. Yeah, it, um, it's the Billups maneuver. Yeah. Like that, the Billups yep. made, yeah. the, the, what, the, the last quarter of his career like off of that. He was a beast in the, from, that, from that post position. So I'd yep. love to see Smart continue to develop that part of his game thoughtfully though right like thoughtfully because again i think i think you're right i think when he's finding those kickouts as much as taking advantage when he can I, I think that's what makes him lethal there is that he's got either one of those options he doesn't have to overcommit one way or the other now we've got grant williams in our run sheet here we pretty much touched on Most all, all of, player of the year at... it's a wrap Sure. <laughs> well, I was going to ask. I mean, we got, we kind of touched on everything Grant related in the Tatum segment. Everyone's is, winning uh, an is award. There anything else you guys want to add? <laughs> uh, not I'd, much. I think we should start him. Tatum gets an award. Start Grant. Brown gets an award. Yeah. Marcus gets an award. Everyone yeah. gets an award. Well, that, that's why I was asking about 
Horford's adamance to to start and like that's yeah. kind of the biggest impedance of of that. Even though it's like statistically it makes sense for Grant to start, I just think you know you don't necessarily associate Al Horford with ego and like the problem of said ego, but I think there's an ego there that will prevent Grant Williams from getting on as a starter unless there's an injury or something like that. You can't be like a seven or eight time all star like Al is and not have an ego, right? Like it that's part of it. And I think what Jay and I were saying before is like the starting lineup is basically just gonna be like that's how we start, but that's not really how we play or how we'll we finish. finish. Yeah. Yeah. But let's it, also, it's like let's also key... just acknowledge he's playing out of his mind. Like like he's I playing great. Oh, Al's none of amazing. us expected this. Yeah. Like even yeah. I was optimistic, but I wasn't even expecting this. Like who is this yeah, guy? A... He's playing better than when he was playing with us before. Like what is this? He had eleven rebounds. <laughs> That's actually kind this of true. He's had like a and... couple of double doubles already. Yeah. He's beasting. He's There's a comment here mind. from from Reddit user Jay Dents who wrote, "This Kemba for Al trade looks better by the day. Unfortunately, we were so weak defensively with Kemba on the floor, uh, and if he wasn't hitting shots, which he wasn't, uh, then it was a disaster." And uh, it's sidebar, guys. Have you have you seen the uh, Campbell Walker, Evan Fournier starting guard lineup oh, yeah. recently on the on the Knicks? I listened no. to a Knicks podcast just to hear how sad they were about those oh, two. That's, that's <laughs> it awesome. was incredible. <laughs> Shout out Adam Taylor uh-huh. for that Celtics blog. He was like, "You might want to listen to this." And their <laughs> argument was basically like they're misusing Fournier, but you could just tell how sad they were about the starters. That, that, <laughs> their starting lineup has played the most minutes in the league, and it's in the fifth percentile defensively. Right. That is Jesus. tragic. Yeah. And yeah, I mean, I love Kemba. Seems like a great guy, but good Lord, am I glad we have Al. <laughs> dude, Al. Yeah. And I, the dude is like, what, he's, he's got whatever Tom Brady's got where it just doesn't matter. Like, he's somehow getting better. I, I don't, I, do not understand any of it. It's some kind of weird magic. HGH is a hell of a drug. <laughs> I guess the one takeaway, the one additional takeaway on the Horford thing is like he, his three ball is starting to go down, which is huge oh, as far as the spacing. And then it's a wrap. And just, yeah. Well, yeah. it's happening. I don't know. Hopefully it lasts. Hopefully the whole Horford experience lasts because you look at his age and I'm, I'm his age and obviously not an elite athlete, like not an elite anything. Or even ben, you know what you just made athlete? pop into my head, Ben. I'm I'm so <laughs> mad at you now because you know what you just made pop in my head. Now it's very it's a very different situation, so don't don't overreact. I'm okay. overreacting, so don't follow my lead on this. But <laughs> in saying that, it just brought to mind the the like really great season we we were having at one point. I I want to say it was maybe 2011 or maybe 2012, but the year that we got Sha- Shaquille O'Neal on the roster, and I Never remember heard of him. Yeah, yeah, and uh, he's a random, <laughs> random role Who? player. Um, yeah, it's a big something, big, big ramrod. I don't know, but big shamrock. Uh, big that's baby. what it was. Yeah, <laughs> baby, baby, baby. Oh my baby. god, yes. <laughs> baby Shaq. All right, we digress. Anyway, sorry, Jay. Go ahead. No, that's all right. Uh, but like we were looking real lovely. Like Shaq was having like yeah. a pretty damn good season, and it was like, oh, we could be a freaking squad with this dude like he was like holding down the paint like we hadn't seen in a minute um and obviously we had been missing perk and all that but uh and then he got hurt like and and it just it kind of dashed all our hopes because then we had to depend on jermaine o'neal who just wasn't up to the same level (laughs) he tried Um, he did try like i'll get you know but it just wasn't happening so now you saying that just put that fear into my head like we're gonna fall in love with everything that's happening with horford now and then like the worst possible thing could happen. And, and now my soul is just like terrified and trembling. So thanks for that. Well, I apologize, but uh, as an older gentleman myself, relative to the average age of NBA players, I just know that these, you know, again, I'm not comparing myself to anyone in the <laughs> NBA or anyone even associated with the NBA, but like some day, days you just wake up and like your body hurts and it's because you're old and you're still putting yourself through the rigors of a 25 year old instead of a 35 year old. And uh, I just, I'm not saying that that's going to happen to Al Horford. I'm not even saying that I even know whether that could happen to Al Horford. I'm just saying that the likelihood is higher given his age, and that keeps me awake at night. He's in phenomenally better shape than Shaq was too. So let's just like let's also <laughs> he's like, he's like six or inches sheed. shorter, like six hundred <laughs> yeah, pounds lighter. <laughs> 
helps. So definitely helps. I think we've got a better chance at, at seeing uh, Horford being effective and impactful in the playoffs than we ever did with Shaq solely for that reason alone. And much better shape than the three of us. So <laughs> <laughs> definitely helps. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Time Lord, Robert Williams, who I feel like I am less inclined to call Time Lord now as it becomes like a more legit player. Like, he, it's like, call this man by his name. Do you, do you guys feel that way all at right. all? Like, he, he deserves to be yeah, called so Rob Williams. Ben's just trying to make it so Chris Forsberg never comes back into the show. I, I, I see what's happening now. All right. You're, 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 you just, you just on, decided man. tonight you're pissing everybody off. <laughs> Have you yeah, ever seen, you guys ever watched The Rob Wire? Nickname? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you ever watch The Wire where at the end Barlow's like, my name is my name. That's where I feel like Rob is That's calling true. out every time he dunks on somebody. That's it's right. like, don't call me Time Lord. My name is my name. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. look, we last 10 games. references nine... in here tonight. I'm loving this. <laughs> last 10 games, nine points per game, 11 rebounds per game, uh, including four and a half offensive rebounds, 78.4 field goal percentage, and a plus 10.3. Also 10. insane. 3. And just 28.7 minutes also per game. Also insane. <laughs> it's crazy. He's so good. I love Robert Williams. I was going to say Time Lord. I love him. He's the man. Uh, we've Again, through talking about everyone else on the team, we've, we've kind of covered a lot of, of Time Lord. But is there anything else unsaid that you guys want to fire off here on, on the guy? I, I will say very quickly, this is all coming in Rob not being optimized too. Because I think, like I said, I, I just do think he's a great fit Nets to have next to Al Horford like they're both incredibly good basketball players so it works but Rob is doing this kind of in spite of the fit being good and it just goes to show like what a draft pick what a friggin contract I mean he's on the hook for 12 million for the next four that contract hasn't even started yet and he's on the hook for four years 12 million a year I mean please stay healthy Rob that's all I gotta say with that all being said, what does that also make him? He's like he's he's quickly becoming the most tradable commodity, um, and the most likely. Don't to say na- that. Well, uh, well listen, <laughs> someone's got to say it. Like, you're right. Like, yeah, you're right. I'm you're not right. even trying. I'm it's not a- even trying to like dump out the Kool Aid, right? Like I'm 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 on the Rob Williams train for sure. Um, even since the Time Lord days, and I'm not gonna let it go. I don't care what Ben says. Like I'm on I'm on Team Forsberg as far as the the nickname goes. Uh, it's better than booba please come right? back like, chris i love how i've come out from this anti forsberg somehow uh, i love chris forsberg just on, on the record <laughs> hey cut that <laughs> but I, it does you know at, at early on in the season i was thinking peyton pritchard had really played himself into being like maybe one of the more prime like tradable assets that we had but i think it's for for reasons that it, it spoons i think you're dead on noting which is that we're seeing a robert williams that's not even being fully maximized potentially right as far as what he could be doing out there he could be scoring 15 a game easy if if the offense was more yeah. geared towards taking advantage of him on the roll and being a lob threat you know we're yep. we're doing that on occasion but we're not really featuring it in the way that it could on on another squad right um i mean the only the only real weakness that's present at the moment is you know he can't he's not going to really be able to handle the ball like Horford can or the way that um you know uh, bam bam can but and he can't he can't stretch the floor with his jump shot at this point um but everything else is just so on point i mean and his his passing is we've always appreciated his passing cuz he's got those those like twitch fingers where he just it just pops right out as soon as he has it if there's a if there's a player that's open like Rob is going to get it there somehow just based purely on instinct but what's really great this season i think we saw like a taste of it last year too is he's being a lot more deliberate in his playmaking now like he's he's taking it seems like a more deliberate role in the playmaking uh and i've really loved to see that like his headiness in the game his awareness he's clearly locked in i love hearing the the feedback too that he's a a heavy communicator on both ends of the floor like that Mm-hmm. that warms my heart like everything is is shining bright for robert williams right now and what his future looks like but i'm also keeping it in mind that again if there's if there's an opportunity to get a big name guy uh you know it's likely gonna mean probably packaging robert williams good problems to have as far as his good value to the to team by the way just to wrap this segment up a comment from user skittlecog they wrote 
Romeo Lankford Loki had a really nice game, two at four from deep, a few really loud rebounds along with his usual stellar defense. But what really stood out to me were his two drives to the basket early in the game. He doinked a floater and a pull-up midi on both, but on both plays, he blew past his defender and collapsed the defense. If he can start to get those to fall and become confident to do it more often, it would be huge a huge development for the scoring and playmaking on this team. Defenders respecting his driving ability will open up the floor spacing for others. Also, shouts to Aaron Neesmith. Cold starting his two threes. <laughs> Spoonie shakes his fist in the air triumphantly. Uh, I know, I know the second one counts in my book, damn it. Referring Same. to his, his toe on the line. <laughs> um, love how hyped the vets were for him. Uh, so just, I guess, nice overall to see some uh, additional development from, from some of our younger bench pieces. Romeo in particular, um, despite what we saw in the summer league, which is sort of the inverse of what we're seeing in the regular season, uh, Romeo is looking like a similar to Grant, just like a key competent role player who you can put out there in certain situations and and rely upon um guys i don't want to spend too much time on this because we're, we're running quite long but uh actually spoony i want to get right to neesmith because we we know what we have to, to use uh udoka's phrasing we know what we have with romeo we don't necessarily know what we have with aaron neesmith and well, if you've been listening to this podcast for long enough, you you know Spoonie's stance on uh, on Neesmith here. So, uh, just tell us tell us how you feel. <laughs> well, Confide if you listen to our last episode, you know that I'm extremely discouraged with how he's played. But I think I think a big part about Neesmith is he's just a pure confidence player. Man, you can almost like see his shoulders hang when mm-hmm. he misses a jumper, and I think that feeds into how he plays defense and how engaged he is on the defensive end because I really felt like he had turned a corner on defense the last few games and then the last two he was a friggin disaster I mean like a all-time disaster on the defensive end and it was just a giant step back and it's like man how do you keep taking these steps back like right when I okay He's figured it out on defense, just got to get the shot to fall. And then he's completely lost on defense the next game. And uh, it's just kind of tough to watch. So I'm hoping him seeing two go down, he looked hype. He looked happy. He looked like he got a little bit of confidence back. He had a nice pump and go where he like blew by his defender and got a wide open like half floater that he he also doinked like Romeo did. Um, So I think ultimately big picture right we were ready to send grant williams to china last year like Mm -hmm. how many people in the sub were like this guy's terrible how many people in the fan base were ready to cut his ass at the end of the year well guess what yeah right guess what like with actual box cutters it's really it was yeah it was was more (laughs) like yeah (laughs) people had knives and swords out like it was crazy (laughs) And uh, now, guess what? Kirk was spoons with like the Dungeons a... and Dragons stuff again. <laughs> yeah, yeah if, if my Stormlight Archives reference didn't tell you I'm a huge nerd last episode, then I don't know what to tell you. But, uh, I mean, we were ready to send him off across the, across the pond to Europe or something, right? And now he looks like one of the better role players on the team. We need to be patient with Neesmith. It's tough to watch. Vanderbilt did not play an NBA defense. They had a mm-hmm. crazy-ass, weird, gimmicky defense. He's had to learn two new defensive systems. He's clearly not a high basketball IQ guy. Like, for his strengths and weaknesses, one of them is defensive basketball IQ. So, give him time. And if he sucks, guess what? He's not getting paid a lot of money. We can just let him go after his fourth season. No harm, no foul. As much as it pains us to watch Tyrese Maxey hang 30 yeah. for Philly. <laughs> I was going to say. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Ooh. Ooh, yeah. <laughs> All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rush us through the last couple of segments we've got here. And this question kind of was triggered by our old friend, Larbird33, who was Shout messaging me about... Yeah, for sure. And, and how you know good it is to have Dennis Schroeder on the team, but how ultimately he's going to walk... And like, who could we trade him to, like, you know, for any real value? Like, it's not like a, a contender is going to give up a first round pick for, a, uh, you know, a point guard who's just going to flee at the end of the year. Maybe they will. Maybe I the Lakers know. will. Ba- we'll see if they are contending. <laughs> That'd be hilarious. <laughs> uh, but it begged the question, 
who is the Celtics' third best player currently? And I posted this on Celtics Reddit, immediately downvoted. Thank you, people of Celtics Reddit. <laughs> Uh, they hate you, Ben. They really do. <laughs> yeah, they, they do. They get, they get something against yeah. Ben. They're like, no one there's, asked there's you to make a podcast about the There's a contingency of the sub that waits for Ben to post stuff, and they just go in and flash down vote him real quick. I'm one of yeah. them. <laughs> it, it tends to balance out over time, Ben. For what, like, you know, I I hope you at least see that silver lining. Like, it always seems to you know weigh out in your favor at the end of the day. But you do definitely have there's a there's a cohort at out first, there that yeah. gives you that. That flash down vote early just to try to discourage you, but you will not be discouraged. Oh no, no, no way! And I, I just tend to believe that it's bots. That's what sort of keeps me, keeps me chugging along here, keeps the morale oh, high. They're definitely um, bots. Well, Jay, let's get your answer first. Who do you think is the third best player on the Celtics currently? Because I don't think it's an obvious answer. We know the answer to this. <laughs> no, I might surprise you because, like, if, if I'm just trying to okay. be sort of a sensationalist jerk. Um, it, like if I were employed by ESPN, I'd, I'd stick to just saying like Marcus Smart because I want to be a blowhard and just like keep generating whatever kind of like you know ridiculous conversation I can off of being ridiculous. But um, you know it's it's tough because we've had a couple of injuries that have kind of like shifted kind of where that hierarchy would be. You know, it's it's got me thinking now that I should go back and maybe redo that um that that rankings that I had done like after the first handful of preseason games. I think right now, with how many games Jalen's been out, it's tough to say. Because if we're just going based off of like what we know, regardless of what we've seen, then it's obviously Tatum, Jalen, and then Horford right now. Like I don't see how you make a case that it's not Horford. Um, but I think it's fair in the during this winning streak that we've had, I think it's fair to say that the way that Dennis Schroeder has held up that scoring load and the, and the scoring vacancy that's been there as a result of Jalen being out, it's hard to to not give him the nod as well. Um, and even though I was talking mad shit about him just a handful of uh, of, of episodes ago, uh, I'm willing to eat the crow and be like, listen, when this guy's not just over dribbling, he is a phenomenal basketball player. And the fact that um, you know, we were able to scoop this dude up during the off season from what we've seen over the last handful of games. It's, it's ridiculous. Um, so I think as of right now in this moment, I would, I would say you either got to go Horford for his general overall impact or Schroeder because of the way he's helped, um, you know, fill that scoring gap in the absence of Jalen Brown. So I think, I think we all agree there's several candidates. It's not clear. That's kind of a indicative of a good team when you've got a clear top two and then you've got a bunch of guys you could argue is the third best player. I would say it's Rob Williams. And so Marcus Smart on NBA.com is third in net rating. You know why? Because Rob Williams is first. <laughs> and the way he's put it together on the defensive end, man, like I was super skeptical last year. I've said this many times, like he does the loud stuff good and the quiet stuff bad. He blocks shots, he gets steals, but then he's completely lost in defending a pick and roll or completely lost off ball. That is not the case anymore. He is like a defensive quarterback out there. He's pointing guys who they need to guard, where they need to guard them, where to cut off angles. And he's also blocking the hell out of shots and also getting picks and also, he's being asked to switch out onto some of the best ball handlers in the league. And he's doing an incredible job. I honestly, truly, 100% believe we are a lot closer to winning that Hawks game if Rob plays. Because he could have switched out onto Trey Young instead of having to double him with Horford and the guard. And that completely changes how we're defending them. That's how damn good he's been on that end. And we already know he's got eyes in the back of his head on offense. With the way he passes, it makes no sense for a, like a relatively unskilled center, like a non-Jokic type center, to be able to pass that way. And his vertical spacing just unlocks a unique thing in the Celtics offense that not a lot of teams have. So I would absolutely say it's Rob Williams, even though I think you can make a great argument like Jay did for Horford and Schroeder. Yeah, and I, I, I support your, your case there. I think it's a great one. You know, I think there's I think there's some space to to talk about the impact that Al Horford's had in helping sure. Rob take some of those steps. But I'm right there with you. I think you're those are all remarkably valid points. 
Yeah, and the, the top comment on that thread is from Equal Satisfaction 2, who yeah says Robert Williams III. So the people have read it. They've upvoted that to the top while downvoting my post to the bottom. And uh, Robert <laughs> Williams is, is the, <laughs> the key uh, standout there. there. There is another comment from Tyler SVGS, who uh, I guess is going into bat for Schroeder. Who they go into right. Right now, over the last five games, it really is Dennis Schroeder. His nose for the basket has made the offensive droughts few and far between, which is true. He's the point guard we've been looking for. He takes opportunistic jump shots, but other than that, he's passing or driving for an easy layup. The last two point guards we had needed the ball more than he does, which isn't that great with JB and JT. I will add to that that if Dennis Schroeder keeps popping that mid-range pull-up jumper once he gets around the screen, which is not in the scouting report for Schroeder, and you can tell based on how he's being defended, like if he's going to keep hitting that, then that's, that's huge. And uh, he's going to get paid, but I don't think that he'll necessarily continue to hit that i do think we'll see a, a regression to the mean there but um and he's not a point guard seen. and he's not really playing point guard like that, that i i and that's just semantics i'm just arguing semantics because i'm a jerk <laughs> but but <laughs> fair enough i, I mean that's, yeah, that's what we're here I, to discuss yeah it, it, so it, it really is so uh you know tyler uh vgs I, i'm not trying to actually pick a, a reddit fight with you um because it, it really is just semantics <laughs> i just don't view him or the way that he's playing out there as as a point guard even when he's over dribbling. And that's why I think I get so frustrated with the over dribbling because he's not really playing sort of a, a traditional point guard role when he's out there, especially when he's out there and Marcus smarts on the floor too. Um, and I think he's, I don't think he's as effective as he can be when he's trying to, or if he's trying to, I, I think when he's playing more of that off off guard role, kind of like more like a Lou Williams, almost um, he's just a better, a better and more effective player. Um, although he can't shoot from outside like Lou Williams can, but he can score inside 10 times better than Lou Williams can. So Mm -hmm. he's like, absolutely. He's, he's the other end of the Lou Williams spectrum. He's the anti Lou Williams. For sure. Now, look, we're going to wrap up here with our two recurring video segments. If you're listening to the pod, you know, on, on iTunes or whatever, highly recommend pivoting to YouTube for this part of the podcast. All right, let's take a look at some of the underrated plays from this Rockets at Celtics game. And we see here off the back of an all right defensive possession from the Celtics, Marcus Smart gets the rebound, coming out in transition. And we see Al Horford set this like sort of fake slash not screen, immediately cuts to the basket, is wide open, Smart finds him for an easy bucket. Now, Al Horford has been looking great. That's just one part of it, but his three ball is also falling. And we see him flare out to the corner here as Marcus Smart gets off an almost impossible pass to a wide open Horford in the corner. Splash, three bomb, Al Horford is back. His three point shot is back. Imagine what that will do if there are spacing. Another thing that is worth highlighting is Grant Williams driving kick game. If Grant Williams is driving and kicking the ball, to open three-point shooters, and we've got a lot to be thankful for here as he does just that, finding Marcus Smart wide open for the three. Let's talk about cutting off the ball, which is something that we've seen more recently in this Udoka offense. Marcus Smart sets the off-ball screen there for Tatum, who just cuts to it for a very easy wide open bucket under the hoop there. Amazing screen set there by Marcus Smart. Now we see Horford in transition. Gets the ball to Tatum. And... We're just going to take our time here, move the ball around the perimeter, and then we're going to post up Marcus Smart right there on the low post, and Tatum just sees this lane. He just times it perfectly, cuts in for again. The wide, almost wide open bucket gets fouled by Daniel Tice and gets himself two free throws. Also great to see. Sticking with cutting off the ball, this is a shortcut really here by Schroeder, who just cuts into open space there as Smart gets the possession in the paint. Uh, and just not something that we would really see last year, so worth highlighting. Also got to highlight Time Lord's passing. We see him initially set the screen, set the screen on the other side and roll to the middle of the paint. Tatum finds him perfectly in the middle there, and Time Lord just finds a wide open Romeo Langford for the wide open three. Awesome, awesome vision by Time Lord. Jason Tatum is back. We see him here with the freeze, freeze the defender, spin move, and then use that length to get to the bucket, which is just amazing. And and Tate is certainly uh, not an incompetent defender by any means, so awesome move by Tatum to get the bucket there. Honorable mention, the smart Time Lord connection we see here. Smart barely gets the shot up, barely grazes rim, immediately regains possession, and just makes lemonade and finds 
Time Lord for the bucket, which was unfortunately waved off. We see Marcus Smart grabbing at the hamstring there. Hopefully he's okay. Worth highlighting, though, because that was an incredible play. Got some energy going in the building and all around. Just good to see. Before we wrap up, we are just going to get to the play of the game from this Rockets game. And, of course, it's one Jason Tatum. And we're seeing coming down the court here in transition and sizes up his defender, rocking him to sleep. Fakes the penetration behind the back, step back, J, splash. And that is not a shot that he's hitting 10 Filthy. games ago, but now he's very Filthy. hot. And I think we're going to see a replay here from another angle. Watch that leg and come up. Just This is this is yeah. like vintage from like his first season. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And the, the way that he rocks his defender mm. to sleep and sort of fakes the drive and gets himself that space is amazing. Now, I had to get Jalen Brown an honorable mention here. We talked about this play earlier in the podcast, but here we see him grab the rebound immediately out in transition. We've got those Jalen Brown fast breaks back despite the hamstring tightness. The Euro step, the left hand off the glass right in front of old mate Daniel Tice. Uh, amazing. You'll have to see it. And that was part of his huge nine point run there. His in the body control these last couple seasons is just unreal. Like, it's I, nuts. It's for, nuts. For all the excitement and enthusiasm I've had for Jalen Brown since we drafted him, I did not expect this. I, I just didn't. Like, you know, I expected all sorts. Like, I still expected him to be great. It just, I expected him to be great in a different way. Like, maybe more like a, like a Jason Richardson was kind of great. Um, but he is. Shout Just out Laura Bird. It. That's who we always compared him to. <laughs> I know. Right? It's Jay I Rich. Know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but he's just he's so much he's so much more. Absolutely. Oh, it's yeah. so glad to have him back and and Time Lord or Robert Williams, if you will, as well. Look, that's going to do it for this one. Thank you so much for listening. Thanks to Celtics J and Wayne Spoonie. If you enjoy the show, please like, Mostly subscribe, share, <laughs> all that good stuff. It really helps our clout online as far as this oversaturated podcasting game is concerned. We'll be back later in the week. Until then, go Celtics. Peace.